Okay, good. So now that formaldehyde has been taken care of, uh, we should do the main the main result, I guess, of today, and then we'll have to sort of offload part of the proof to next time. But it would be nice, uh, as you've seen, it gets quite laborious to try to prove that even very simple polynomial functions like x and x squared and so forth are integrable. So it would be nice if we had some general theorems in the same way that in the sort of limits and continuity section we proved that every polynomial was continuous just by using general theorems about limits of sums and products. It would be very nice if we had analogous results for integrability so we didn't have to go through these proofs for for every new function that, that comes down the block. So that's what I would like to do in the second act. Uh, we're almost ready to prove this one of the kind of one of two, I guess. The fundamental theorem is, of course, uh, more important than this, but one of two main results in this chapter is the statement that if f, any function, any real valued function f is continuous on a closed interval a to b, then f is necessarily also integrable on that interval from a to b. So that's what I'll more or less prove in the next couple of slides, but there will be one kind of remaining detail that we have to hammer out next time. So at one step in the argument we need this this idea called uniform continuity. It's different from ordinary continuity. And I'll highlight that step and then we'll come back and treat it more carefully. Um, probably next time we'll have to finish that up. But uh, Okay, so let's put that aside for the moment and just say what happens if we try to prove that a continuous function is integrable. Okay, so first I'd like to highlight one thing that in this theorem we only assumed f is continuous. However, if we go way back to the review when we spoke about integral, to say that a function is integrable we had to also assume it is bounded, right? So we only define integrable and by extension integral of a function which is bounded on an interval. So if I want to prove that a function is integrable, I had better first show it is bounded. But of course that's very easy when it's continuous because we've shown way back in chapter 2 this boundedness theorem that if you are continuous on a closed interval, which is what we're doing here, then you are necessarily bounded. So we don't have to do that separately. right? So we know the function f is bounded because it's continuous on a closed interval. So fine, okay. We've taken care of that first first detail. But now we have to get to the meat of the proof. To show that this guy is integrable, we have to show that for any epsilon, we can construct a partition p of the closed interval from a to b with the property that the upper sum in p minus the lower sum in p is smaller than epsilon. Okay, so to do that we have to use this uniformly continuous sort of argument. So first let me sh tell you what we claim is true about f and then I'll explain why we don't actually know that this is true. So we know f is continuous but we don't know he is uniformly continuous. What does uniformly continuous mean? This means that on this interval from a to b there is one single delta, there's one number delta with the property that for any pair of points, x and y, which both belong to the interval from a to b, we know that if the distance between the two points x and y is less than delta, then the distance between the function's outputs, f of x and f of y, is smaller than whatever number we want. So we'll choose a convenient number, right? We can choose, we'll see why this number is convenient later, we choose epsilon over 2 times b minus a. Okay, so why is this different? Why is this different from the usual definition of continuity? The usual definition of continuity is in terms of limits as x goes to a of f of x and saying that these are equal to the function's values. And when we defined continuity of functions like this, we said that first you fix a given point a. You fix the x value. Then you say, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta, right? So the order matters extraordinarily, <laughs> right? In, in the old definition of continuity, you first say, pick 
the x value, it's approaching a. Once you pick that, that x value, then if someone hands you an epsilon, you can find a delta. So the fact that in this argument we first said pick the x value, then someone hands you an epsilon and you have to pick a delta, that means that since we first fixed the x value, delta depends on both the value a that we fixed beforehand and the value epsilon. So that's the usual story, the usual version of continuity. The value of delta depends on both the point a and the epsilon that someone hands you. Notice that what we're doing here is totally different, right? We are saying that delta does not depend on the point a. We are saying that for any pair of points in the interval, x and y, there is a single number delta which only depends on epsilon but not on the points x and y. That's why we call it uniformly continuous, right? It's continuous but the continuity is uniform in the sense that you can use the same delta regardless of the points in question, x and y. We're saying that for, for any x and y, the same delta works. It only depends on epsilon but not the points. Uh, okay, so I will make that a little more explicit in Act 3, but I just want to flag it for now to tell you that we're, this, this is not your grandfather's continuity. This is different from what we did in Chapter 2. Uh, it's totally unrelated. Well, not totally unrelated, but it's, it's a more stringent condition. Okay, fine, so we'll come back to all of that. Assume for the moment that you believe me that for some reason f is uniformly continuous, so we can pick a single delta which does not depend on the points. And if that's true, well, okay, fine, then apparently this, is, this, this whole argument goes through that we can find a delta with this property. Now we still have to construct a partition p. So we can pick whatever partition we want, we get to pick all of the points. So why don't we just pick a partition where the distance between each of these points, that is the ti minus ti minus 1, which is the widths of these rectangles that we're building, we're going to pick these so that the widths are all less than delta. Right, so if you like you could just pick a uh, kind of uniform chopping up of the interval into pieces, but make sure that each piece is less than delta in width. Right, you can always pick n large enough so that all of these guys are less than delta in width. Okay, I claim if you do that, then this works in the sense that it satisfies the definition of integrability. So I have to show that, which I will do on the next slide. We have to show that this satisfies the definition of integrability. So how do we do that? Well, let's look at each sub-interval separately. So we look at each, you know, t i minus 1 up to ti, and we are interested in the lower and upper sums, right? So I guess I should use a different color, but I guess there's some, some lower sum which gives us a lower rectangle on this interval, and there's some upper sum which gives us some upper rectangle on this interval, and these guys are associated with some, you know, max and min that the function achieves or supremum and infimum to be more precise on this interval, right? So he hits some supremum at capital M and some infimum at lowercase m. Okay, fine, that's great, but both both of those points where he achieves the infimum and where he achieves the supremum, they both belong to this interval t sub i minus 1 up to t sub i. And we know that the distance between the two of these distance is less than delta because we chose our partition to have that property. So, okay, fine. So that means that the point where you hit the infimum and the point where you hit the supremum are less than delta apart. But if we go back, well, I claimed that if two points are less than delta apart, then their outputs are going to be less than epsilon over twice b minus a apart. Okay, but that means that the supremum minus the infimum, since they are less than delta apart, 
then those, those outputs must be less than or equal to. There's one subtlety here. Why did I go from less than to less than or equal to? Well, these are the infant soup, not the actual function values. So the function can get very, very close to some value but not quite hit it. So that means that if this guy is always less than some m sub i, then his supremum can be equal to that m sub i, but not less than it. So I have to go from less than to less than equal. A small subtlety about the way that soup and inf work, but that's a, a small point. So anyway, so roughly speaking, these guys are you know, related to two function outputs, which are less than delta apart. By the previous slide, if the inputs are less than delta apart, the outputs are less than epsilon over twice b minus a apart. And certainly epsilon over twice b minus a is less than epsilon over b minus a, right? This guy's smaller because we divide by two, right? Okay, good. So I have argued now that under these assumptions, the soup and inf are going to be differing by an amount which is less than epsilon over b minus a. So now we're almost done. We just have to show that the difference between the upper and lower sums is smaller than epsilon. Right, so let's just do it. So we know the upper sum is the sum of the capital M's times the widths, and the lower sum is the sum of the lowercase m's times the widths. So if you factor, their difference is simply the difference between the suprema and the infima times the widths from i equals 1 to n. I've just argued that this first factor, the sup minus the inf, is smaller than epsilon over b minus a. So we can put that in here and pull the epsilon over b minus a out of the sum. So this guy is less than epsilon over b minus a times the sum of the t sub i's, minus t sub i minus 1's. And now we've seen this many, many times uh, last session. This, this looks like t1 minus t0 plus t2 minus t1 plus t3 minus t2 plus dot dot dot, something which I have repeatedly referred to as a telescoping sum, right? So we just telescope, which means you cancel all of the intermediate pieces, and the only things that remain when you collapse the telescope down is these outermost pieces, the last guy tn and the first guy t0 but we know Tn is the last guy on the right, which is B, and T0 is the first guy on the left, which is A. So at the end of the day, the telescoping sum becomes B minus A, and now you see why I chose this epsilon over B minus A on the previous slide, because this cancels beautifully with the B minus A from the telescoping sum, and we're left with epsilon. So, okay, lots of algebra, but remember, I was trying to prove that for any epsilon greater than zero, I can build a partition so that upper minus lower is less than epsilon. And now that's exactly what we've done. I'll just erase all the junk. To focus on the big picture, I built a partition and showed you that in that partition, upper minus lower is less than epsilon. That's the definition from our reformulation of integrable. So modulo this small subtlety about uniform continuity, which I'll prove in a moment, or start to prove in a moment, uh, we now see that every continuous function is integrable. So indeed, in our kind of uh, catalog of niceness, we have now justified that integrable is below continuous, which is below differentiable. So we've now completed really three-fourths of the tower of niceness, which is calculus. We've now proven all of these except for analyticity. Okay, questions on this? I thought there, pardon me, I thought there were a few more things on this tower of niceness. Uh, yeah, so this is, I guess once differentiable, you can inject in here two derivatives, so C2, you can put three derivatives, which is C3, you can put as many as you want, you could have C infinity, infinitely many derivatives. So 
when I say differentiable, I really mean, you know, we've already spoken about multiple derivatives, so we've kind of proven that part of the tower as well, right? If you have two derivatives, you certainly have one. So there's a whole tower of derivatives, which is kind of hidden in this first part. And in the bottom, uh, actually, this isn't in the tower. When I drew the tower the first time, I realized I was, I was kind of wrong. So there's kind of a separate piece, which I should draw like this, which is limits existing. Right, so certainly if you're continuous, all of your limits exist, but limits existing are kind of in a nebulous place between integrable and continuous, because now we've seen that you can have an integrable function where limits don't exist, right? You can have an integrable function where, I don't know, we saw one where you move a point, but we'll see, I guess later, that you can also have a step function like this, where the limit does not exist, at the point of the step, but it is still integrable. So I really shouldn't call this a tower. I should call it a, I don't know, a diptych, I guess, if you're an art fan. I don't know, how do you spell this, diptych? A diptych is a two-panel piece of artwork. So there's really two panels. There's the right panel has to do with limits. The left panel has to do with smoothness. So uh, I'm, I'm starting to botch this analogy, but the point is that we've now proven on the left side of the diptych that you have integrable, continuous, and differentiable, and then there's a bunch of other junk that goes in between differentiable and analytic. Uh, and then there's some junk about limits on the right side. Good. Random question. Are all polynomials C infinity? Yes, all polynomials are, in fact, analytic. So that's the oh. best you could possibly be. Okay. If you're analytic, you're everything. If you're analytic, you're differentiable, you're continuous, integrable, you have limits everywhere. So polynomials are here, and they're very nice. Analytic. Very I nice. described analytic as being able to look at any section and get the entire function. Yeah, so... This is, this is related to in the calculus of complex numbers, which is sometimes called complex analysis. Um, we have something called an entire function. What is an entire function? Well, it's related to analytic. So analytic is roughly the real number version of an entire function. And what analytic really means is that if I tell you the values of this function on any open interval, say this is a, and this is, I don't know, any small number, a plus delta, and this is a minus delta. If I tell you all of the values of the function on this open interval, no matter how small delta is, then you can just write down immediately what are the values of the function everywhere on the whole real line. So this is analytic, but now you see why in complex analysis you use the word entire. I actually like the word entire better because it's more intuitive. You can get the entire function from knowing what it does on any open interval. So that's analytic. And uh, indeed, polynomials have this property. Um, you could actually prove this right now with what you know already because you could say, suppose this guy is a polynomial and I know his values on any open interval, well, I would say, okay, what do I need to take the derivative of a function, right? I don't need to know the values of the function far away from the point. I only need to know the values of the function very close to a point. So you could say, if I hand you a polynomial, you know the values of that polynomial on an open set around a point. So that means you can take the derivative, so you know f prime, you know the second derivative, f double prime. You know the third derivative, f triple prime, dot, dot, dot. You know every derivative you want, right? Because you can differentiate this guy as often as you please. But if you know this guy's a polynomial, then you know that if you take enough derivatives, you're going to eventually get zero. So if I handed you the values of a function on an open interval and told you that that guy's a polynomial, what, what would you do to find out what he is? Well, you would just keep taking derivatives until you got zero, and then you would say, okay, well, I needed n derivatives, so I know this guy is an n minus one order polynomial, and then roughly speaking, you would just 
anti-differentiate up. Right? You would keep anti-differentiating. And now you're thinking, oh, but I thought every time I anti-differentiate, there's a constant. So I don't really know what the function is, because I could add a constant. But that's not actually true, because you know the value of the function at this point. Right? So you can't add an arbitrary constant, because you know f of a has to be this number. So you can't shift him by a constant, because you know he has to be here, because I told you all of his values on this interval. So there's actually no plus c involved. There's no plus constant, because you know exactly what he has to be. So uh, basically, you just you know differentiate until you get 0, then go backwards, kill all the constants, because you know what they have to be. And then you know the whole function. You know the entire function, if he's a polynomial. But um, anyway, that was a, a very shaky, hand-wavy explanation <laughs> of why you know the whole function. We will prove this in more detail when we do Taylor and Maclaurin series. This makes total sense. I'll look forward to it. Good. Good thought, though. Uh, other thoughts? I have no other thoughts. Cool beans. Okay, let's let's wrap up uniform continuity. Okay, so what was the kind of hair in the, the soup, if you will, the issue with this proof? Well, in the kind of main step, I made the following claim that if my function f is continuous on a closed interval, then if some guy hands me an epsilon greater than zero, then I can pick a single number delta with the property that for any pair of numbers x, y, which both belong to the closed interval a, b, whenever the distance between those points is less than delta, then the distance between the outputs is less than epsilon. I made this claim and one should immediately object. If you've been paying attention and know how continuity works, then when I make this claim, you should say, bullshit, that is not how continuity works. The definition of continuity is that given a point x, you first fix the point x. Then, given epsilon greater than zero, you can find a delta such that absolute value of x minus y less than delta implies absolute value of f of x minus f of y is less than epsilon. So in other words, the continuity that we learned in chapter 2 has the property that that delta that you need to pick depends on both the point and the epsilon, depends on the point x. But in the proof that I gave you a moment ago, I made the bold and unjustified assumption that delta does not depend on the point x. It only depends on epsilon. So that cannot stand. I mean, uh, fine, maybe... Maybe in a high school calc class you would brush this under the rug, or more likely in a high school calc class you would never talk about any of this, because you would just start writing down uh, integrals of functions without proving shit, but uh, we're not going to do that. We need to make sure that all of our, our ducks in a row and everything has been proven. So I have to fix this. Uh, this. This is not true, based on what we know so far. So that will be the content of Act 3 today, which is only a couple slides but then also probably a bit of next meeting on uh, Monday, I guess. OK, so we have to fix this issue, which has to do with uniform continuity. So OK, I've hammered this point several times, but I just want to do it again, because many students, when they first see this, don't understand what the big deal is. So I want to emphasize that it's actually a big deal. Uh, let's look at an example to see why it's a big deal. Very simple example the parabola, f of x equals x squared, right? It's a polynomial, so we know sure as shit this thing is continuous. We've proven this multiple times. Uh, so if this guy is continuous, what does that mean? The definition of continuity is that if a is any real number, then for every epsilon greater than zero, there is a delta such that whenever x is delta close to a, then the function value, which is here the square, so x squared, is epsilon close to a squared. But you should be very careful about the order of the quantifiers, these existential, or sorry, the universal and existential quantifiers. The order matters a lot. So what is the order that I've written here? This order is saying for every number a, start parentheses, for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta 
such that you know all that junk with the inequalities right so for every a for every epsilon this is not the same as what I claimed in the proof a moment ago which was for every epsilon greater than zero start parentheses there exists a delta such that for every a junk involving inequalities what is the difference here the for every a is outside here the for every a is inside so you say what's the fucking point surely these commute right maybe i can commute this for every a inside absolutely not you cannot compute commute uh quantifiers like for every and there exists and this sounds like a stupid point but many of the deepest proofs in mathematics and even in physics uh, there's a lot of you know, people do proofs of this ads cft correspondence and compute correlators and things like that in string theory and they get the wrong answer because they commuted you know uh, quantifiers involving every and there exists and uh, you don't want to make that mistake because if you publish a paper and you're wrong then you know your career is seriously damaged so let's try not to be wrong and not damage our careers so uh, okay we should not commute these these quantifiers why is that let's just look geometrically and see why that is right so why is it that we should not commute the for every point inside the for every epsilon? Well, it's pretty obvious. You just look at a function like a parabola and notice that it's growing faster when the value we're looking at gets bigger. So what does that mean? It means that if I pick a relatively small point A and I would like to find a delta so that my output is within a distance epsilon of a squared. I, yeah, I, have some, I have some leeway here, right? I have a pretty large delta I can pick on either side because this guy is not growing that fast. But if I pick a larger point over here like this b, and I want to, you know, same output tolerance, right? I would like to pick a delta so that my output is within the same distance of the target output as it was in the A case. But look how skinny this fucker is. I have much less leeway in the case of B because this function is growing much more quickly. So, I mean, I'm, I'm beating a dead horse here, but this picture makes it very clear that the value of the delta you should pick to guarantee your output is within epsilon of some target is absolutely going to change based on the point you're looking at, right? It absolutely depends on the point. You can't just move the point inside. The point matters. Okay, so I've, I've I mean, I'm probably uh, frustrating you with the frequency with which I'm saying this, but uh, questions or thoughts on this point that delta should really depend on the point? I do not have any thoughts or questions. I agree, and it does not make any sense that you can choose a delta. Okay, good, good. I hope you're convinced because sometimes people get angry with me when I when I mention this point. Okay, so we're going to move towards a kind of theorem that'll tell us when we can sort of uh, when we can pick the same delta for all of the points, right? Because that's what we want to know. When can we do that? Obviously, it doesn't work all the time. So certainly for the parabola for f of x equals x squared, as we just saw on like an open interval from I don't know zero to two or something this guy's growing faster and faster towards the end so we cannot pick a delta that works for all a on the same interval right if this is 0 to 2 or b to c or whatever but here's an interesting observation if we have a closed interval so if we include those two endpoints so maybe I mean looks like it's 0 here but I guess I'll call these b and c and he's growing faster and faster but we kind of cut off at this right endpoint and say this is f of c. So now you could say, okay, well, here it's a bit easier because we're including the endpoints. So you just say, you know, let's look at all of the points and ask what is the delta which I would need to guarantee a particular output tolerance epsilon, right? So I want epsilon here which means I would like to know what is the delta here. 
and clearly that delta depends on the point, right? You're going to get a smaller delta over here because the function is changing more quickly. So I need a smaller delta over here, but I'm including the endpoints, right? So in this case, when I include the endpoints, I have a trick. I would just say, okay, well, my deltas are going to get smaller and smaller as I go towards the places where the function is increasing most rapidly. So here, maybe if this is, uh, I guess I called it n. So maybe I should call this, you know, n on the right. So in the case of a closed interval, you just say, okay, well, the size of the delta I need is probably very small over here. So why don't I just take the smaller of the two deltas at the endpoints and say that's going to be the smallest delta I could ever need, right? If I pick that delta, maybe it's going to work everywhere inside, right? Because these should only need smaller deltas, or sorry, these should need larger deltas. So if I pick the smallest one, I should be in good shape. I mean, you might think that works. Uh, we haven't proven it, but it's an idea. Uh, another idea is looking at this function sine 1 over x, which, as we saw in the Spivak stuff, right, he oscillates infinitely frequently near the origin, and then he starts to slow down. So we know this function is continuous except at that point where the denominator blows up. So if there's an open interval, say from 0 to 1, this guy is continuous on that interval but he's certainly not uniformly continuous because we cannot pick a single delta that works for every a because you can always go very very close to zero where this guy is oscillating very fast and then find a place where he's oscillating fast enough that that delta you picked won't work anymore but if instead I had a closed interval closed interval like this you just do a sharp cutoff on the on the endpoints then you would say okay maybe I I have some chance of finding a single delta for the whole interval now because I could just go you know go to this point here where he's oscillating the fastest that should be the smallest delta you might think that's the smallest delta and then pick that one and then it should work everywhere else because everywhere else needs a larger delta you would think so I mean anyway this is uh, not a proof this is just some ideas or some intuition but um, Okay, so thoughts on the intuition? I have no thoughts on the intuition. This is simple enough. Okay, good. All right, so then let's try to make this a little more precise. So we want to sort of quantify this relationship between open and closed intervals. And the first thing that we need to do that, which looks a little unrelated, is this sort of technical lemma. Oh, first the definition. Yes, I should say this. Uh, good. Yes, so what is the definition of uniform continuity? Well, I've already hinted at it, but let's say it precisely. So a function f, a real valued function, is said to be uniformly continuous on any interval a. Notice I don't say whether it's open or closed, but any interval a, if for every epsilon greater than zero, there is a delta such that for all x and y. So notice I have moved you know, the for all x has been moved past the for every epsilon. That's the main point of this section. So the for all x and y has been moved past the epsilon. So anyway, it's uniformly continuous if for all of that junk, whenever x minus y is less than delta, then f of x minus f of y is less than epsilon. So this is this part is the usual definition, right? You get a given output tolerance if I pick the input tolerance accordingly. So this is the definition. The only change is moving the x past the epsilon. So now let me go back to that interval definition and uh, intuition stuff that I was just kind of expounding on. So we need this technical lemma. Uh, it's a bit of a pain to prove and it's, it's uh, very ugly, but whatever, let's just do it. So uh, we're going to look, this is, I would, I mean, by the way, just kind of to roadmap what we're doing. I like to think of this as like a so-called stitching together lemma. So this is roughly speaking stitching together two closed intervals which meet at a point B. So anyway we'll, we'll see when the proof comes up that we would like to stitch together some closed intervals and we need 
to understand this continuity statement about the you know stitched together version of a pair of closed intervals uh, anyway so fine what's the statement suppose we have three real numbers a b and c in order so a is less than b is less than c and we have a function f which is continuous on the whole interval so from the smallest point a up to the largest point c and then someone hands you an epsilon greater than zero you also assume two things about the behavior of the function on the left and the right intervals right so we assume we know what's going on on the left and right and we want to figure out what happens when we stitch the left and right together so what do we assume we assume okay on the left interval which is a to b if you have any pair of points x and y in a to b and the distance between those two points is smaller than delta 1 then you know the outputs are within distance epsilon okay so this is really just saying it's uniformly continuous on you know this uh, this a to b we assume we know the same thing about the right interval the b to c uh, if the input distance is less than delta 2 we, we know that the output distance is less than epsilon so we know what's going on we can control the functions behavior on the left and right intervals then what can we say about the you know joined or stitched together interval the statement is that there exists a delta such that if x and y are in the total or the stitched interval that contains both the left and right sides then the same thing goes through right whenever x minus y the input distance is less than delta then the output distance is less than epsilon so in other words this is just saying if you know that this is true on the left and the right then you know it's true in the total version okay so I mean it's pretty simple to, to think about but I mean the proof is a bit of casework so it's not especially pleasant but let's just do it so in particular since f is continuous on the whole interval from a to c we know that f is continuous at this point b in the middle so he's continuous there uh, okay well what does continuity at b mean well if he's continuous at b then by definition of continuity there exists a delta which I will call delta 3 to avoid confusion there is a delta 3 with the property that if x is within distance delta 3 of that point b then the outputs are within whatever distance we want and I'm going to choose for later convenience as you will see epsilon over 2 okay fine that's just continuity um, I'm just going to restate that in another way to compare it to the points 1 and 2 on the previous slide right because 1 and 2 on the previous slide were these two things about the left and right endpoints and showing someone is less than epsilon so I will call this point 3 which is the statement that if x minus b is less than delta 3 and y minus b is less than delta 3 then f of x minus f of y absolute value is less than epsilon uh, why is that true well because if this is true which is I've just copied this assumption here well then if y minus b is less than delta 3 as well let me clear this because it's getting confusing yeah so if y minus b is less than delta 3 then by the triangle inequality then this f of x minus f of y this comes from writing the triangle inequality for f of x minus f of b and f of y minus f of b and applying the triangle inequality right because both of those guys are less than epsilon over 2 so when you triangle them and apply their sum that is going to be less than epsilon which is twice epsilon over 2 so I won't write that out to belabor the point because you've seen it many times now and proven it in fact so this is from the triangle inequality okay now we're almost almost done. I just I'll write down the answer and then prove that it prove that it works. So uh, there are three deltas in the game at this point. There's the delta one and delta two in the statement of the lemma. There's the delta three which I constructed here. And now all we're going to do is take the minimum, the smallest of those three deltas. And I claim that what we need to prove is that there's a delta greater than zero with certain properties. I claim that if we pick this delta the min of those three it has those properties that we have to prove it has 
So, okay, fine, I claim this works, I should show you it works. Uh, so there's three cases. This is the painful part. Uh, we have to prove that this works in three different cases because x and y can be in any of these three subintervals, right? So there's one possibility, which is that x and y are both in the left guy. There's another possibility that x and y are both in the right guy. And the third possibility is that they straddle one x in the left and one x in the right. So we have to handle those three cases separately, which is a pain, but we'll do it. So the first case, let's suppose x and y are both in AB, which is the left side, right? So they're both in AB. If they're both in AB, well, we already, did you say straddle again for fuck's sake? <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good, if they're both in AB, that's good because point one tells us that if these guys are both in AB and their distance is less than delta 1, then their output distance is less than epsilon. But their input distance is certainly less than delta 1 if it's less than delta, because delta is the smallest of these three, right? So if their distance is less than the smallest of three guys, it's certainly less than each of those three guys individually, in particular the first one. Uh, good, so that case is easy. If they're both in the same side, then just apply assumption 1. You can probably see the second case is pretty fucking similar. If they're both in the right side, if they're both in BC, you know, if X and Y are both here, well, their distance is less than delta, which is certainly less than delta 2, so their output distance is also less than epsilon, and we're fine. Okay, so fine. The only interesting case is the case where the point B is fucking the hole formed by the two legs X and Y, so in that case, either x is less than b is less than y, or y is less than b is less than x, clearly because either they straddle, you know, as drawn, either x is here and y is here, or y is here and x is here. Those are the only possibilities. But I claim that these possibilities are handled by our case 3, right? Why is that? Well, we have assumed that the distance between x and y is less than our delta, which is the minimum of these three things. But if the distance between the three of these guys, so we have, I don't know, say x, b, and y, and we know the distance between these outer guys is less than delta, then clearly the distance between either of the inner guys must also be less than delta, right? Because they sum to something less than delta, so the two pieces certainly have to be less than delta as well. So the distance between x and b is less than delta, the distance between y and b is also less than delta, but thankfully that's exactly what we did in case 3 here, right? We proved if both of these guys are less than delta 3, and indeed delta is less than delta 3 because delta is the min of these three, uh, so if these guys are both less than delta, then their outputs are within distance epsilon of one another, which is again case 3. Okay, a lot of work, uh, kind of boring casework, but What's the big picture? The big picture is roughly that if we have this version of uniform continuity on two closed intervals that touch each other, and then we stitch them together where they touch, then we have a version of uniform continuity on the stitched together Frankenstein interval. Okay, good. Thoughts on this rather technical lemma? I still have no thoughts or questions or comments or death threats. Death threats. Okay, good. Is the lack of thoughts because it's very clear or because you're bored? I think it's the former. Okay. It's all clear. It's okay if you're bored, by the way. I'm, I, I concede this is not the most interesting thing in the world. Okay, last thing then, uh, which I think we'll prove last time because we're coming up on two hours, but this is the reason why we developed all of this painful, you know, lemma technology and stuff like that. So the thing that we will prove in the first part of next time is that on a closed interval in the special case, the special case where we are just looking at a single closed interval, then if a function f is continuous on that closed interval, it is also uniformly continuous, right? So what does that mean? Uniformly continuous was the statement that 
we can pick the same delta delta for every x, right? So this is not true on an open interval, on a union of a closed and open interval, on a half open interval, or on a general set which is neither open nor closed. But the theorem we will prove is that on a closed interval, then you can exchange this assumption that f is continuous with the seemingly stronger assumption that f is uniformly continuous, the same delta for every x. Right? So I'll prove it next time. Uh, it's a bit of a long proof, but that's fine. But without the proof, let me just remark that this is exactly what we needed in that integrability proof. Right? So this was the proof that continuous on a closed interval implies integrable on that same closed interval. Uh, good. So the, the statement is that once we have this theorem, once we have proven this theorem, then we will be totally set. We will have shown that every continuous function is integrable, which is very useful. And as one final side note, this is why we had some brief discussion last time that I kept talking about integrating on domains. A domain is an open set. And I said the domain case was more difficult because domains are open, so you typically define integration on a domain like an open set by, you know, constructing some approximation to the open set, which is actually a closed set, and then taking the supremum over the integrals over all closed sets. So you could ask, why is why are open sets so so hard, right? Why they sound very similar? Why is integration over an open set different from integration over a closed set? And uh, it really boils down to this, right? Um, the statement that uniform continuity exists on a closed set but not an open set is really the punchline. Uh, this is why closed sets are nicer for integration than open sets. Um, which, I don't know, probably is not something that will make sense to you unless you become uh, a math major, but I will inject it now inject as a mysterious comment. Is it like trying to take the area of the idea of a hexagon rather than a hexagon with edges? The idea of a hexagon, what does that even mean? Like, I don't, I don't even know why I had that thought, but like, you could, since there is no clear border to a, I say the hexagon is like a, a type of set, specifically the open set, as a way to just visualize it. For example, a hexagon with sharp edges is the closed set. So you're talking about the left case where we include the endpoints, and then the right side, which in math we call the interior? the hexagon? Is that the question? Kind of. Yeah. Yeah, so on the, yeah, on the left we have everything including the borders, and here we just have the inside, but not the border. Yeah, is that what you're saying? Is the problem with our open set not having the, well, not really having way to handle the border? Uh, it's related. So it ends up being, in this case, that the area of these two guys is the same. Uh, which you would expect, right? How could how could adding a bunch of lines change an area, right? <laughs> a line has zero thickness, so it doesn't have any area. So these two should really be the same. So uh, there's a subtlety in defining it. I don't think it's related to the existence of a boundary or not. I think it's related to the way we've decided to define things, right? The way we've defined continuity just works very nicely with closed sets and therefore uh, shapes, with shapes with boundary and not shapes without not boundary. Shapes without boundary. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm saying this poorly, but it's something which is, it's something which is very obvious very geometrically. Obvious. You look at these and they say, I mean, these should have the same area, but the way that we've formulated our mathematics makes it difficult to prove that. I like the straddle discussion happening on this side. Yes, there is a straddle discussion. <laughs> Christian, why? Is that going to be added to the song about me, I wonder? Uh, good question, though. Good question. I, I'll think if I can come up with a better way to answer that. But uh, By the way, I'm looking forward to tomorrow's DC. Oh, the, the Python one? 
Yeah, I say it tomorrow, even though I could do it now. Yeah, I realized when I was writing it, I should have just, like, made it more open-ended. Like, you know, write a numerical integrator full stop and not said anything after.